Mr. President. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I lead for the Opposition on the Government Sector Employment Legislation Amendment Bill 2016. Um, the Opposition will not be opposing this bill on the second reading vote, but we do have a number of concerns with the legislation, which uh, I will outline in my contribution. Um, and I know that there are a number of amendments from the Christian Democratic Party. The Opposition also has uh, some amendments which have also been lodged with the clerks, which address some of our concerns and which we would urge uh, the Government and indeed all honourable members to give close attention to. Uh, Mr Deputy President, during the passage of the Government Sector Employment Act in June of 2013, the Government indicated that a second stage bill to align the police, transport and health senior executive services <coughs> would be introduced later that year. The Government Sector Employment Legislation Amendment Bill 2013 was introduced but was then uh, withdrawn. Before the House is the latest iteration uh, of the concepts in that bill and it contains much of the same features. Uh, the GSELA bill aims to align the senior executive service of police, transport and health with employment arrangements in the public service. Mr Deputy President, the New South Wales Labor opposition opposed the government sector employment legislation and committed to a review and a rewriting of public sector employment laws at the 2015 state election. We are therefore cautious about the bill uh, before the House. Um, the Labor opposition had a number of concerns about the GSC Act and the concepts in it and the framework uh, that underpins it, uh, which I outlined fully in my second reading contribution on the 19th of June in this place in 2013. And I, I will not repeat the things I said uh, on that occasion. Um, the Government Sector Employment Legislation Amendment Bill now before the House will amend the GSC Act, the Health Services Act 1987, the Police Act 1990 and the Transport Administration 1988 to uh, bring employment arrangements for senior executives in the health service, the police force and the transport service into line with employment arrangements for senior executives in the public service under the GSE Act. Um, the, the bill will also bring employment arrangements for non-executive employees of the New South Wales Police Force who are not police officers into line with the employment arrangements for non-executive employment employees of the public service. The bill also facilitates the mobility of senior executives between each of the public service, police, transport and health with certain caveats and riders. So, for example, if people uh, not from a health background are to be moved as senior executives into the health service. It can only be done with approval of local area health boards and the like. So there are certain uh, safeguards and caveats. But the mobility provisions are not opposed by the opposition. Um, but we do have some concerns about whether bringing all of these different employment arrangements from the different sectors into one constellation, as it were, is necessarily desirable because the purpose and function of the police force is incredibly different to that of the public service generally, and whether uniformity or convergence of employment arrangements for their own sake um, is a desirable thing is, is doubtful given the different purposes for which the different services were created. As I indicated, we don't have any problems with the mobility provisions. The bill also makes consequential amendments to the GSC Act, including provisions dealing with the transfer and secondment of government sector employees between agencies and the termination of employment and compensation payable to senior executives. Now, the absence of substantive rights in the area of termination is already an issue in the public service, uh, and, we, and we highlighted this in the parliamentary debate on the GSC Act, and it appears that this issue will now be extended into the areas of health, police and transport. What is interesting, and I'd ask the uh, parliamentary secretary to give some thought to this in her reply, but one of the, one of the things done, for example, on page five, Clause 20 of the bill is it provides a new subsection in section 39 of the GFC Act, subsection 7, which provides that the regulations may make provision with respect to the compensation, if any, to which a public service senior executive whose employment is terminated is entitled under his or her contract of employment. But if you look at that existing provision, section 39, I think it's subsection 4, is it H and I? There's, uh, it already touches on the compensation issue for senior public servants. Um, uh, 
it actually deals with it substantively, I think, in H, and I, I think, talks about any matter dealt with in the regulations. So it's quite clear that this is a matter that could already be comprehensively dealt with, and in fact it is dealt with in Schedule 1 to the Government Sector Employment Rules. There is a, a model contract, if you like, for senior executives in the public service that says you know, on termination the rights are governed by, I think it's 30, Section 36 of the Government Sector Employment Regulations. Um, we don't think those provisions are adequate, but nevertheless the issue is comprehensively dealt with in a legal <coughs> way, and so we just query and would like the government to elucidate why the new subsection 7 is deemed to be necessary uh, in this situation. We, we don't oppose it, we think there is a problem here, but I don't think we think it's a problem for the same reasons as the government do, so we would like them to uh, elucidate that. The bill will also now explicitly exclude Crown Law officers from the summary removal provisions of the Government Sector Employment Act. Um, and it does this by an am amendment to Section 76 of the GSC Act. And I'm dealing with uh, Clause 63 on page 9 of the bill. Um, now, we think this is a good thing. But in fact, uh, contrary to what the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary said in her second reading speech, and contrary to what the Parliamentary Secretary in the other place said. Um, this is an issue that was well ventilated in both places during debate on the GSC bill. Um, the Labor opposition clearly raised this as an issue that, although unintentionally, the terms of the GSE Act overrode and abrogated the security of tenure of a range of important statutory office holders such as the Solicitor General, the Crown Advocate, the DPP, the Deputy DPP, the Solicitor for Public Prosecutions, the, and Public Defenders and Crown Prosecutors. And we, in, our, in, in debate, both in the second reading contributions on that bill and in debate in committee stage, we said that although unintentional, there was this abrogation of their security of tenure, and it should be dealt with by way of an amendment to the legislation to put it beyond doubt. Uh, the Labor opposition did put forward an amendment on the 19th of June 2013. Um, this place divided on it and it was negatived and it, the amendment was lost. But I imagine my surprise, Mr Deputy President, when I see the uh, Clause 63 amendment, which is word for word um, the amendment which we proposed two years ago. I guess, Mr Deputy President, it's worth observing that uh, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. It's good that the government has recognised that, although unintentionally, uh, in their zeal to enact the GSC framework, um, a significant damage was done to the independence of those important public office holders and it's now going to be corrected. We strongly commend the government for um, bringing this uh, amendment to, uh, to the parliament in the form of this bill. Um, we think that is a good thing um, because the, the mischief that we adverted to was you could imagine a situation where whether it's a public defender or a Crown prosecutor or the DPP could take a course of action with which the political government of the day disagreed and in the hue and cry of public outrage over a matter, a government could conceivably decide to remove that office holder from their position. Um, at the moment, uh, only Parliament, each House of Parliament, can do that. And I don't think, I think honourable members would think that would be a bad thing. And so that's why it's a good thing that this amendment uh, is in this bill. The bill also provides for the reinstatement or reemployment of senior executives in circumstances where the Public Service Commissioner believes uh, the employment was terminated either wholly or substantially in reprisal for a public interest disclosure. I'm dealing with proposed clause 83 capital A on pages 10 and 11 of the bill. The absence of statutory provisions for the reinstatement of senior executives, including in circumstances in which termination was a proposal for public interest disclosure, has been raised, I believe, in the past with the Public Service Commissioner. Um, clause 84 capital A of the bill addresses this. Uh, the explanatory note to the bill says it's intended for this provision to cover not only the public service but also senior executives in health, transport and police, which is done, if you look at page 9, clause, subclause 9, 
the definition of senior executive does capture uh, all of those different services, so we, we do welcome that. But we do think that the drafting is a little uh, cumbersome and a little bit clumsy, but it also rests on the notion of the Public Service Commissioner being satisfied that a, wrong, a relevant wrong was done, deciding then, the wrong having been done and established, uh, that a person should be reinstated or reemployed, and that a further hurdle of then um, giving a direction under Section 13 to the head of the relevant agency to reinstate or reemploy uh, a person. And of course, there is a further hurdle where the person's employer is the minister, the commissioner may make a recommendation to the minister that the person be reinstated or reemployed, but it's only a recommendation, it's not a direction. And so you have a situation where a substantive wrong could be done to a senior executive, uh, but, but there could be no remedy even where the Public Service Commissioner feels uh, that there ought to be. Um, one of the issues we had with the GSE framework, Mr Deputy President, was not just the, uh, we think, the overweening centralisation uh, of authority over the public service, which is now to be extended to health, police and transport, um, but the concentration of power in the person of the Public Service Commissioner. Now, no criticism of the holder of that office, but we think such centralisation of power is not a good thing. Um, Soviet-style centralisation really ought to be relegated to the past. And what this bill compounds is... Well, I'll acknowledge that interjection. Um, but the point is that uh, not only is, is that control and authority concentrated over the public service now to an unprecedented, well, uh, to an extent uh, uh, not seen since the days of the old public service board, uh, but now that centralisation is to extend into health, police and transport. And again, as I indicated earlier in my contribution, the idea of centralisation and control for its own sake is not a good thing uniformity in all circumstances or standardisation does not necessarily make different services fit for purpose. You have to have regard to the purpose for which they were created and the function they discharge. And so um, we think in relation to the reinstatement or re-employment of persons whose employment was terminated substantially in reprisal for public interest disclosures, while we commend the government for pro providing a mechanism which was previously missing, we think the bill would, should be complemented by the creation of an alternative remedy um, reposed in the independent umpire, the New South Wales Industrial Relations Commission. That is, an aggrieved person should be given the choice of whether to pursue a remedy through the Public Service Commissioner or to go to the independent umpire and make their case. And we will be proposing an amendment that gives effect to that policy concern. Um, we share the policy approach of the government that uh, the omission in the original legislation of such a remedy uh, should be fixed. Um, we don't, we, we do have some concerns about the model proposed by the government, but rather than just CARP, we will, we're providing a, 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 a constructive... A positive vision of the future. Uh, a constructive alternative remedy which we think should sit alongside it. Um, this bill will also, as I indicated, uh, allow for control over senior health, police and transport employees by the Public Service Commissioner through the government sector employment rules, which will be extended now beyond the public service into those other services. Uh, now, these rules are determined by the Public Service Commissioner, but they are not able to be scrutinised Parliament, by Parliament or disallowed like other forms of delegated... Um, legislation. Uh, part of our criticism of the GSE framework is these government sector employment rules. It was a key feature of the GSE Act, not only to uh, simplify statutory employment arrangements, but to move much of the substance and detail of public sector employment out of the legislation and into these public sector employment rules made by the Commissioner. Um, the rules are not subject to any parliamentary scrutiny or oversight, which diminishes 
the role of Parliament in overseeing the administration of the public sector of New South Wales, but also, um, as I indicated, although the iteration of these new GSC rules in health, transport and police will require the Public Service Commissioner to consult with the Police Commissioner, the Health Secretary or the Transport Secretary on the content of proposed rules. Importantly, uh, none of those office holders will have any veto over what is proposed by the Public Service Commissioner. Now, I know the Government says that the holders of those offices have all collaborated on the authoring of this bill and they all support it. Um, I don't seek to cavil with that, uh, except to say that if they had a full appreciation of the degree to which uh, the Public Service Commissioner could then reach into and determine the substantive content of employment rules and relationships and how things are to be done and what is to be the legal content of those things, um, even against their objection, um, I, I think they would have some concerns because, it, again, it, it brings under the auspices of the Public Service Commissioner uh, those other services. And I'm not suggesting that the Public Service Commissioner would willy-nilly uh, do this, but there is that significant risk that over time you would see uh, the extension of that control and the determination of what should be the substantive content of the employment relationship and its legal obligations in those rules is a real problem. Uh, it's a problem we see, and uh, my original thought was that those provisions in this bill that provide for extending the government sector employment rules to these other services should simply be removed. Um, and that would remove proposed uh, claw, uh, at Section 81 capital F from the Police Act or 121E of the Health Services Act or 68 capital E of the transport legislation. The problem with that is the way this bill is structured is that the, so much of the content of how things will work, the the moving machinery that will actually give life to these arrangements uh, in this bill uh, would, be, would be removed. And so a whole bunch of things that, frankly, would need to be fleshed out in the form of government sector employment rules would simply not be able to occur, uh, not only sabotaging the legislation but I think impeding probably the, the effective operation of those services over time. So instead, uh, what the opposition will be proposing is an amendment which meets our original policy objection to the GSC rules in their current form, and that is that they would still be able to be made by the Public Service Commissioner, as he can do now, and we would not seek to change the way in which he could do so for health, police or transport, but like all other forms of delegated legislation, the GSC rules should be disallowable instruments. That is, they should be able to be scrutinised by this place and by the other place. Not to interfere with the proper workings of executive government, but to provide a proper check and balance, a proper scrutiny by the Parliament of the work of the Public Service Commission and the Commissioner. Because we simply think we're posing too much power in the hands of one institution and one person is a recipe for disaster at some point, irrespective of whether it's the current Public Service Commissioner or any other future holder of that office. We just think this providing a proper check and balance would be a good thing. We are concerned that this potential over centralisation, this sort of Stalinist Soviet style approach by this government towards public sector employment, and we just think it needs to uh, have, a, have a calmer approach. Another area that the Labor opposition has some strong concerns about. Um, <coughs> Well, I'll acknowledge that interjection. But another area that the Labor opposition has some strong concerns about in relation to this bill is in the area of remuneration, benefits and allowances for senior executives. And I'm dealing here with the proposed amendments to the health services legislation and proposed section 121G subsection 2, proposed section 39.2 of the Police Act and... 68 capital I2 is proposed in this bill for the transport uh, legislation. These provisions would permit remuneration packages to be awarded to senior executives <coughs> that are outside the range determined for a position 
under the Statutory Officers Remuneration Act 1975. Um, now, I know that the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary gave a rationale in her second reading contribution about why this was uh, uh, in the legislation, uh, that um, the tribunal used to have such a power that its removal was inadvertent and it was simply restoring the status quo. Um, I don't agree with that analysis, but even were that to be so, the idea of having a system that determines remuneration in bands for certain roles and positions uh, and then determining that in consultation, of course, with the Public Service Commissioner, uh, the head of these agencies could um, determine a remuneration package for a senior executive or class of senior executives within a range higher than the range determined under the Statute and Other Officers Remuneration Act for the band in which the executive or class of executives is employed, we think is a recipe for disaster in the public sector. We, we, we do understand the need to attract and retain suitably skilled and qualified <coughs> professionals. We do understand that. But it is the case that senior executives in New South Wales are not badly paid, particularly compared to their political masters, the ministers, um, under any government. And I think they are relatively higher paid than in any other jurisdiction in New South Wales. And I don't cavil with that. But it's a matter for... The, well, I acknowledge that interjection, but the idea about setting the bans to attract and retain people, that should be a matter for the tribunal under the Act and a matter for reasoned argument before that body to determine what are the appropriate bans. And that might mean in the appropriate case, if you're talking about medical specialists, for example, and arguing to argue for a higher upper limit on, in, in a given ban, not for the head of the health service or the police commissioner or the transport secretary to decide that for a person or class of persons will just simply go outside the rules. What that runs the risk of is significant remuneration increases for senior executives well outside government wages policy, for example. Regular graded public sector workers working hard through the week delivering services to the wider community of New South Wales, they have their pay set by awards and agreements. And the amount they can get from year to year in increases is capped by the government wages policy. We've had this argument in this place many times about the 2.5% wages policy, and I won't repeat those arguments. But those workers who deliver the services are capped. These provisions provide a bypass mega highway for senior executives to bypass the government wages policy. Whether that's the intention or not, it's a, it sends a bad signal to the hundreds of thousands of hard-working public servants that because you're a regular public sector worker, it's OK for us to regulate down your wages and conditions, that, uh, to impose a ceiling on what you can have that increased by year to year, but that won't apply to the people at the top of the food chain. They will get a separate special deal where the government wages policy can simply be bypassed. That is such a bad signal to send to the workforce, oh, no. working Quite hard so, to yeah. deliver services to the, the wider community, and we think it should not be allowed. And we will be proposing amendments in this debate, and when we get to the committee stage, <coughs> to remove these provisions from the bill. Um, if the government wishes to revisit this uh, in a slightly differently calibrated way that would meet uh, a more reasoned policy objective, we're happy to have that discussion with the government, but we think this simply sends not only a wrong message but provides, frankly, even more than exists at present, a sort of a two-class system. If you're a regular graded public sector worker, there is one set of restrictive rules that apply to you, but if you are a senior executive under the GSC framework, you get a separate and much more beneficial deal as long as you can persuade the head of the service uh, to reach that remuneration package outside the rules set by the independent statutory and other officers remuneration tribunal. The Labor opposition also has concerns about the termination provisions proposed for senior executives in the police area, particularly those who are sworn police officers. 
particularly those who are pre-1988 police officers. The interaction between the holding of a police office and the availability of certain superannuation entitlements on termination and the impact of proposed termination provisions in the bill on those entitlements we think is a significant issue that requires careful scrutiny. Um, we understand that the Police Association have deep concerns about the interaction between the new proposed Section 40 of the Police Act and Section 28, dealing with superannuation matters. And I understand that the Christian Democratic Party will be bringing amendments forward uh, in the committee stage to address those concerns. And the opposition will certainly be uh, supporting those amendments. As, but, we may, we re, but we are also concerned that the amendments must address the concerns for all, whether we're talking about the police commissioner, the deputy police commissioners, assistant police commissioners or other senior executives as, termed, as determined under this legislation. Uh, whatever the rule is for one should be the rule for all and people should not uh, be disadvantaged relative to their current legal rights um, uh, upon the enactment of this legislation. But I do have a further question um, for the government, and that is relating to page 32 <coughs> of the bill and the proposed section 40 dealing with termination of employment. Now, as I said, it's substantially the same as the existing section 51 of the Police Act, but whereas that provision deals with removal from office, the terminology here in the proposed new section 40 is terminate the appointment. Removal from office on the one hand, or terminate the appointment. And I'd ask the government to illuminate the chamber as to why that significant change of terminology, because on the, on the one hand, um, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, a very significant change, but I assume there is some thinking beyond the passing fancies of parliamentary council as to the words they use, that there is meant to be some substantive legal change affected here. Now, it may relate, as I indicated earlier, to that adverse impact on superannuation rights upon termination for certain senior police officials should this bill become law. And maybe that change in terminology causes that negative impact. Um, if so, the amendments uh, to be brought forward by the Christian Democratic Party may not actually achieve that objective if the words in proposed section 40 remain the same. What I say to honourable members, whether it's the government or the crossbench, is in our haste to pass a law, um, let's not uh, overlook important areas that require careful handling and dealing with in a, in a balanced way, because in our haste to enact a bill, we don't want to create a situation where um, uh, people's existing superannuation entitlements are taken from them or reduced in some way. And again, if the government does intend to effect a substantive legal change in the terminology, uh, sorry, in, in the legal rights of persons who may be terminated um, under Section 40, it would be useful for them to place those reasons on the record. Um, so that the Parliament and indeed the wider community can understand why, why those changes are being proposed by the government. Um, there may be other areas, Mr Deputy President, not, not touched on in my contribution which require careful and more, uh, more time to consider as well, but the debate is now upon us. Um, we of course have the capacity to not finish the debate today. We have the capacity to not deal with the committee stage today if people still have significant concerns about the effect of the bill and its impact on different classes of employees. Uh, and if other members have those concerns as we do, we ought to hasten slowly and deal with this in a mature and reflective way. As I indicated at the outset of my contribution, Mr Deputy President, uh, the Labor opposition will not be opposing the bill because we understand that compared to the current state of the Government Sector Employment Act, uh, there are 
improvements that this bill brings to that legislation, well, there are for the GSA Act, we remain concerned about the extension of that framework uh, and the concepts in it to health and police and transport um, because we think the whole GSE framework and the concepts underpinning it are flawed and we remain <coughs> committed to a substantive proper rewrite of these laws uh, should the Labor Party come to government. But um, given the time with which we've had to deal with the bill before the House now, um, we have prepared amendments which deal with some of our concerns. Um, so we will support the bill on the second reading to propose our amendments and to see uh, the amendments of the Christian Democratic Party. And if the improvements to the bill are sufficient, we won't be opposing it on the third reading, despite our existing and ongoing concerns about the GSC framework. Um, so I'd urge the members to uh, be attentive in the committee stage and to bring a fair mind to the <coughs> proposed amendments that the opposition will be proposing, because we bring them forward uh, in an office, in, an, in a spirit of uh, non-partisanship to try and improve the proposal brought to this chamber by the government. <coughs>